Well, good morning, Grant Memorial. It is good to be with you this morning, fixing our eyes on Christ and listening to his voice together as we find ourselves starting a new ministry year. I, I for one, cannot believe that September is here. School is back in session. We have already hit the negatives overnight on the thermometer. And next week, we'll begin a, a new series that will lead us up to Christmas. <laughs> Time, yeah, some people really like Christmas. We've got to clap here. Time has been flying by. And as it has, we have spent 17 weeks, if you can believe it, digging into the hymnal of God's people in the book of the Psalms. We've gained insight over these past 17 weeks, insight, permission, and vocabulary to approach God in each and every season with every emotion, no matter what, where we happen to find ourselves as the whirlwind of life swirls around us. Now today we put a period at the end of the sentence in this series and we at least corporately close the hymnal for now knowing that we are invited to use it as a powerful resource to help us pray, praise, lament, learn about, and cry out to God in each and every season. So with that said, would you turn with me to the period at the end of the sentence, the final song in the Psalter, Psalm 150. And if you're not exactly sure where the Psalms are, you can use the, uh, the table of contents at the front of your Bible or just flip to the middle of the book and you'll likely be in or around the Psalms. And we're reading today from the last Psalm, Psalm 150. This is what it says. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this past uh, four months and, and how what you have taught us, how you have walked us through uh, different seasons, different emotions. We have learned about you and we have been invited to approach you in new and biblical ways. And we pray today as we wrap this up that you would continue to teach us, challenge us, equip us, Lord, that, that, that because of the words of this psalm, we would be changed and we could approach you in new and incredible, meaningful ways. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is how it ends. <laughs> the culmination of 150 songs. Uh, this is the conclusion of all the trials, the struggles, the ups and downs. This is the answer to all of the questions, the wonderings, the fears, the tears, the ebbs and flows of life represented in the Psalms. And it all ends with praise. It all ends with praise. For some of us today, if you don't take anything else from our text this morning, besides this truth, that is okay. Because you need to know this. The ending, the final word is and will be praise to God. Wherever you may be, uh, whatever psalm may resonate with you in this season, the ending for those who know and love God will be praise and thanksgiving. In the end, God wins. And those whom he has saved will respond in worship. Church, we know how the story ends. And it ends with God being praised for all of eternity. 
Listen to how Revelation 7 describes the reality of the end of days. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Every nation... Every tribe, people, and tongue will praise the Lord. That is the real period at the end of the sentence. And this psalm, Psalm 150, is placed where it is to stress that truth. That the ending is and will be praise. In fact, uh, the message of Psalm 150 is a perfect bookend for how the hymnal starts in Psalm 1. Does anyone remember 17 weeks ago when we started this series, what the main point of the text was? I'm going to just imagine in my mind that everyone is nodding along at home, saying, yes, of course I do. Right? But the main point, the way the, psalmist, the, the, way that the songbook started was by providing a distinction between those who take God's word seriously and those who don't, right? The, the first psalm, if you remember, was a call to live a life under Torah or in submission to God's word. As verse 2 in Psalm 1 said, Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. The, the book of Psalms begins by inviting us to submit, to trust in, to give authority to God's word in our lives. And this last Psalm, Psalm 150, shows us the outcome of living such a life. The result, the consequence of a life lived in submission to the word of God and trust in him. As theologian Walter Brueggemann says, such a life we just described, a life under Torah in submission to God, trust in him, such a life arrives at unencumbered praise. Such a life arrives at unencumbered praise. Whenever we have our where does my help come from moments like we read in Psalm 121? Or our God, why have you forsaken me seasons like Psalm 22? Or when we find ourselves entrapped in our own sin as we explored in Psalm 51 or entrapped in the mud, Psalm 40. Or when things are going well for us, Psalm 100, Psalm 136. Those who believe and submit to the law of God, those who trust in the Lord and lean on him in all of those circumstances, those who look to God's promises in the midst of the chaos will see his promises come to fruition. God will win. And we ultimately will find ourselves praising him as a result. So Psalm 150 gives us our appropriate response in every circumstance. Praise. Because it foreshadows what is to come. Praise. As Christ is the victor in every circumstance. But this psalm does even more than that. Psalm 150 uh, gives us the template for praise today. Right? How are we to praise God now when, well, victory is assured, but it has not yet come to pass? Right? It's like winning a hockey game 1,000 to nothing with five minutes left. Right? Victory is guaranteed, but there's still some time left on the clock. 
How do we praise God? How do we participate in Psalm 150 before every tongue and every nation bows down to worship? And the way I'd like to go about uncovering this template, as we find in this psalm, is by asking the six W's. You know, the six W's. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. It's a little known fact that there's a silent W at the front of the word how. Not many people know that. Uh, Okay, fine. It's five W's and one H. uh, But that doesn't flow very well. So please humor me as we ask the six W's of praise as outlined for us in Psalm 150. So let's start with who. The who of praise is God. The who of praise is God. Look at verse 1. Praise who? The Lord. Verse 2 says praise God. And then we have nine consecutive praise hymns, right? I think it's on the screen. Praise him, 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 praise him. I don't know if that was nine. But then it ends off with two praise the Lords at the end of the psalm. Right? According to Psalm 150, it's pretty evident that the who of praise is God. Now, just to help us make sure that we know that praise is not about me, I'm not the who, my preferences, my feelings, my emotions, I want you to turn to the person beside you and say the who of praise is God. Right? The who of praise is is God. God is the recipient of praise because he is the only one worthy of all praise. Right? And this one was pretty simple. This was a simple W, but it's crucially important. God is the object of biblical worship. Now we move to our second W. What? The what of praise is praise. The what of praise is praise. Wow, thanks, Cam. Really good stuff here. I get it, right? It seems like we shouldn't even need to say that. But unfortunately, we need a reminder every so often. Because as selfish people, we make things about us, don't we? We make things about us, and when we do that, we can find ourselves missing what it is we're actually doing when we're in God's presence. So the reminder is necessary that praise is not about us getting something from God. Praise is about us giving something to God. Now I'm going to repeat this, and I want you to contemplate that idea as it pertains to what you expect when you worship God, or when you come on a Sunday morning, or when you uh, spend time in God's presence. Praise is not about us getting something from God. Praise is about us giving something to God. Church, whether we admit it or not, right? whether it's subconscious or not, I think many of us see worship, especially corporate musical worship as expressed in this psalm, as a time to receive something. Maybe maybe it's a word from God. Maybe it's a feeling or an emotional experience. Maybe it's a moment to be transformed or changed or it's a nostalgic episode. Whatever it is, if it's not about God being praised, church, we have missed the point of what we're doing. We do not worship God to get something. We worship God to give praise to God. Him. Praise is the what, not some sort of experience or feeling generated. Now, it is important to note that you can, and it's very likely, you can have an experience when you worship. You can receive a word from God. You can be changed and transformed in praise in the presence of God. But these things must never be confused with the point with what is going on, right? The word here for praise, as we read in our text, 13 times in six verses, by the way, 13 times in six verses, means 
to celebrate, to admire, or to boast about, right? This is an outward expression, not an inward experience. Praise is boasting about God, declaring that which he is and that which he has done, which we'll get to in a minute. Church, what we are doing when we participate in Psalm 150, when we participate in praise, whenever we gather to worship, what we're doing is pointing to God and praising him, boasting about him. And if I don't receive anything, if I don't have an amazing worship experience, If I don't feel something, feel different, it doesn't matter. If we have declared, boasted about God, if we have given him the glory, we have accomplished the goal of praise. Because that is what we're doing. That is the point. The what of praise is praise. The next W is when. When are we to praise God? Well, pretty obvious answer, always, right? Always. These statements, all 13 of them, right? All 13 praise statements in here are imperatives. They're commands to praise so as, as we saw when we looked uh, a number of weeks back at Psalm 100, commands to praise are not determined or qualified by our circumstances, right? Our text doesn't say, if you're happy and you know it, praise the Lord, right? That's not what it says. No, it says praise the Lord 13 times. Do it, right? Your circumstance really has nothing to do with it. There is not a moment where praise is unnecessary or inappropriate. Okay, think about that for a second. There is not a moment where praise is unnecessary or inappropriate. We are invited to praise God at all times. And that brings us to our next W. Where? Where does praise happen? Well, this W is answered right at the beginning of the psalm in verse 1. It says this, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens, right? Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. The where of praise is in his sanctuary and in his mighty heavens. Now, does this distinction ring a bell for anyone? Again, I'm hoping people are nodding along, um, but that might be wistful thinking. Uh, About a month ago, we found ourselves in Psalm 11. Remember the psalm that has the chiastic structure or the poetry that looks like a Big Mac uh, for those who remember it that way? I hope this is ringing a bell. But either way, the middle section of the psalm, the main point made in Psalm 11 was verse four. And verse four said this, the Lord is in his holy temple. He's in his sanctuary. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. Right, The same distinction here. And and we concluded that no matter where we happen to be, no matter what happens around us, we can know that God is in his holy temple, which means he's among his people, he's with us, and he is in control over everything on his heavenly throne. We can trust in him because he is both with us and above us. Well, this distinction is made here as well. And if it is true that he is both present among us and active over us, as Psalm 11 suggests, if these are the places where God resides, then he is to be worshipped in these places as well. He is then to be worshipped in the sanctuary, which is among his people. The temple or sanctuary is the place where God resides among his people, with his people. So that means that God is to be praised by us. That God is to be praised in the sanctuary is to be praised by us, us, the people of God on the earth, right? In our homes, in our churches, in our lives. But it also says that God is to be worshipped in the heavens, 
which extends the call of worship, of praise, to the heavenly host as well. Think about that. This call to worship in Psalm 150 is more than just a call to us. This is a call to all of creation, all that was spoken into being by God to boast about their creator. Right? The call of this psalm is for us humans to join in with all of creation in heaven and on earth in the praise of the almighty God. If you flip back two psalms with me, to Psalm 148, which is a part of this kind of ending doxology in the Psalms, we get a deeper look into this reality. Starting at verse 1, it reads, Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created and he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. Lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and cedars, wild animals and cattle, small creatures, flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. Church, we are but one part one instrument in a song of praise to our God that all creation joins to sing, to worship, to point to and boast about the one who is above it all. As Old Testament commentator Derek Kidner says, his glory fills the universe. His praise must do no less. Right? His glory fills the universe Every nook and cranny, the heavens, the earth, all that is in existence. So his praise must reach no less than that. Perhaps it's Psalm 150 that Thomas Ken had in mind in the 17th century when he wrote the famous words, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him who? All creatures here below but praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Church, we are called to praise God. But if we choose not to, God will still be praised. If we choose not to, God will still be praised. In Luke 19, 37 to 40, Jesus affirms this. Listen to this passage. When Jesus came near the place where, uh, where the road that goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. That'd be a cool scene. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, they said. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, Rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Right? If we do not sing, if we do not praise, God will not cease to be praised. All of creation recognizes who their creator is. And if we don't praise him, he will still receive the glory that he is due. The rocks will do our job for us if they have to. Church, may it never come to that. May it never come to that. May God always receive praise from his people. Our call to worship in this psalm is an invitation for us to join with all of creation in praise. Now, if you're like me, 
this next W is really important. You want to know why, right? You want to know why. The what isn't good enough. You want to know why. And our psalm outlines the why of praise in verse 2. It says this, Praise him for his acts of power and praise him for his surpassing greatness. The why of praise is God's acts of power and his surpassing greatness. Now this is almost identical uh, to what we heard in Psalm 136 a few weeks back when we were commanded to remember who God is and what he has done, right? Those are the two categories of praise. We praise God for his acts of power. Our praise is born out of a remembering of what God has done both generally that he created all things, that he has given us everything we have, as well as specifically for the way he has worked in our lives, that he's been available to us, that he's walked us through the trials of life, that he has saved us, lifted us from the pit, and given us a firm place to stand eternally, right? We ought to remember what God has done and praise God for those things. I hope there's a Rolodex of memories that goes through our mind as we praise God and as we thank him and as we lift him up, right? And beyond that, we're also called to praise God simply because he is God. He's unsurpassed in greatness. He is God. If, if he didn't even do a thing for us, his magnitude, his greatness, his eternal existence demands respect, fear, and praise. If you've ever uh, been to Banff and looked out over the vast mountain range, or, or you've ever uh, stared into Niagara Falls up close, you understand what I'm talking about. There are moments of awe and wonder of how grand, how powerful, how beautiful something is when you feel dwarfed by the magnitude of that which is before you. And there's an admiration, a praise going on. But this admiration, this awe and wonder has nothing to do with if the mountains or the waterfall have done anything for you. It's simply based on what they are. God, who is infinitely more awesome than any waterfall or mountain that he created, by the way, deserves our awe, deserves our wonder, our praise and admiration simply for who he is. Praise him for his surpassing greatness, as our text says. And just as an aside, if you ever feel like, you know, I, I, I don't feel like worshiping, or you don't have anything to praise God for, friend, open your eyes. And I say that in the most uh, pastoral way that I can. God is worthy of praise because of who he is. He is beyond our understanding, beyond description. He's outside of restrictions. He is limited, limitless, all perfect, loving, and good. There are not enough words to describe him, nor do we have the time in our lifetimes, let alone one sermon, to adequately uh, describe the majesty of God, infinite and intimate as we heard Dom teach last week. And beyond all that, as if he needed to give us an additional reason to praise him, this majestic God on his own volition, not because he needed to or we deserved it, chose to give us life, pour blessing into our lives, to make himself available to us, and ultimately to die himself so that we could have eternal life. So I'm sorry, I'm just not feeling it right now is not an adequate excuse to not worship God, to not lift your voice in praise. We have an infinite number of reasons to praise because of who he is and what he has done. You see, if we can bring ourselves to stand and scream and cheer when a measly piece of rubber goes into a net at a Jets game <laughs> that will be forgotten in a week or less, 
we can certainly bring ourselves to lift our voices in praise to the one who was and is and is to come. Which brings us to our last W, or our first H for those who have no imagination. How? How do we praise God? Well, from verse 3 to 5, Uh, we're given a list of instruments with which we can praise God corporately. Now, uh, before we pull out a checklist, right, before you, you know, jump to it and cross-reference it with the instruments that we have on stage, I I want you to know that this list is, is representative and not exhaustive. Okay, this is representative, not exhaustive. So those who are panicking that the organ is not listed in here, it's okay. And likewise, for those who are wondering if harp or lyre could be translated as electric guitar, right? This is not an exhaustive list. It's not an exclusive list. What the psalmist is saying here is praise God with all the instruments, right? Praise God with with all the instruments, the solemn ones and the exuberant ones, the quiet ones and the loud ones, the percussive or melodic, any and every instrument is enlisted in the praise of God when it's in the hands of a worshiper. Right? Church, the psalm says simply, worship with what you've got. Praise God with everything you have. The how of praise is with everything. Right? The how of praise is with everything. Everything. And that concept applies beyond musical praise. We're, we're to offer everything to God in every area of our lives. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, yourselves, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, Jesus says, you know, it's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, right? We praise with all we have, all that God has entrusted to us. But because this psalm is specifically referring to to musical worship, to musical praise, we will focus there as well. And church, when it comes to corporate musical praise, that we praise is mandated. How exactly we praise is not. Okay, let me say that again. That we praise is mandated. How exactly we praise is not. And by that I mean style, right? This is assuming that our lyrics are biblical, our theology is accurate, that we're singing truth about the one true God. But if these things are happening, If we are worshiping in spirit and in truth, as Jesus outlines to the woman at the well, the medium that we use in worship is not prescribed for us. Just a quick glance at this list lets us know that worship style is not a thing to God. Clanging cymbals is a joyful sound when they're in the hands of a worshiper. You see, praise is not about our preference. It's not about our comfort. Because as we've already discovered, it's not about us. It's about God's creation. Joining to boast, to to make loud and grand, declaring who God is and what he has done. Right? It's about creation joining together to boast about our Lord. Every instrument in the hands of a true worshiper can participate in the praise invited by Psalm 150. And while you might not like a particular style or I might not like a particular song, it really doesn't matter because God welcomes it all. I remember a while uh, back being at a wedding and uh, when the time came for the dance, for the music, I was pretty disappointed because I didn't really like the playlist. You know, the couple liked country music, and the hits just kept on rolling. Uh, you know what I realized in that moment as, as I made my comments or voiced my displeasure? 
No one cared what I thought. No one cared, right? It wasn't about me. The party wasn't for me. My opinion didn't matter one bit. Church, when we gather to worship, the party is not for us. Right? When we gather to worship, the party is not for us. It's for God. Right? We are but the invited guests. Is God honored by worship led with drums and guitars? He sure is. Is God honored by praise in the form of four-part harmony and an organ? He sure is. Is God honored by someone who has no musical ability lifting their heart before him alone in their bedroom? Yeah, he sure is. Style is not the issue. It's not our hill to die on, church. It's not to be judged. If, if we have a fight, church, it shouldn't be about how we worship, but that we worship, right? It shouldn't be about how we do it. It should be that we do it, that we are coming before God to point to him and boast about who he is and what he has done. Which brings us to the final verse of the entire book of Psalms. Verse six. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You know the details. You have the template. The six W's have been answered. May it be so. Praise the Lord. And this isn't uh, simply a theological lesson that we give, you know, uh, mental assent to. This is a command to participate, and that starts right now. It starts right now. We're going to sing a song in a minute, and our opportunity to join in the song starts now. Or I encourage you to go back to the beginning of the service, hit rewind, and listen to that first package over again where our worship team led us through three incredible songs about who God is and what he's done. Rewind back and declare the goodness, the greatness, the wonder of God. But it starts right now. Wherever you are sitting, whatever you may be feeling, may we be people who join in with all creation in the praise of our God. And may we be counted among the number we read about in Revelation 5, 13. It says, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Church, I want to be in that number, I want to be a part of that choir. I want to join in that song. But it starts today. It's not a, a future thing. It's an invitation to join right now, to be among those in heaven and on earth who use the breath we have been given to praise the one who gave it. Out of all the vocabulary that we've been given over the past 17 weeks, this is the most important vocabulary. The language of praise. Because this is what we've been created for. And because this is the vocabulary we will be using for eternity as we join with all of heaven and earth to praise the one who sits on the throne. Praise the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for, for all that you've done. 
And God, we, we, we apologize, Lord, that, that we let so much time pass without saying those things. Help us to be people who worship you. Help us to be the people who are joining in the song of worship, of praise in every area of our life. Lord, but corporately, may Grant Memorial be a place of worshipers, people who know who you are and who point in your direction. God, we love you. Help us to learn to love you more and help us to show it in the way that we approach you with hearts full of praise. In Jesus' name, amen.